Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here with me at Strange Loop today. I am really excited to get started. Um, so before we begin, my name is Bonnie. I am a software engineer and the tech lead on the Gizmoduck team at Twitter. We're named after a DuckTales character. You can see him on that slide. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that they were like DuckTales fans as a fandom still. Um, so the name's not important. What matters is that we're part of core services. Uh, we run the user service and the social graph service at Twitter, among other things. And those services manage all user data and information about relationships between users. So that's things like, what's your screen name? What's your profile name? Are you following someone? As you can imagine, that means that we get to see some pretty fun problems. And I'm going to be talking about some of them today. So specifically, I'm going to be focusing on a deceptively simple technique, scaled TTLs, that we use in order to build confidence in the values that we store in cache. Um, and I'm going to begin with a pretty general overview of caching in distributed systems. So if you haven't done distributed systems design before, don't worry. We're going to start off uh, fairly basic. Um, and then I'm going to build up to explain the motivations behind the modern day caching architecture that we use on the Twitter user service. So if you want to find me on the internet afterwards, as you would expect from a Twitter engineer, I'm on Twitter. I'm at Brindell. Uh, you can also find me on my blog at bonnieeisenman.com. And I'm also the author of Learning React Native, which has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today. Uh, but it's about how to use JavaScript to build mobile apps for iOS and Android. And it's at that bit.ly link. All right, so let's get started. We're going to begin with a very common story. So you're working on a new project. You're just trying to build an MVP. You have successfully followed a Rails tutorial, and now you have a simple application layer talking to your database. Uh, when you get requests in, you serve data out of your database, and everyone is happy. Good job. Um, so let's say that your startup actually gets some traction. And whether it's something goes viral or organic user growth, you get a big spike in traffic. Uh, this is really exciting. It means that people actually like what you built, and they're using it. It's also not so great. Uh, you weren't actually prepared to handle that much traffic. Uh, some of you might recognize the since retired fail whale, which used to be something that you would see on Twitter when this happened. All right, so now you have an application that you built, and sometimes it falls over. So what do you do next? So there are several right answers. And I'm stealing this quote from Donald Knuth, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, the answer to how should you scale your application will always depend on the specifics of your particular use case. So the first step is always to measure and figure out what your problems actually are. Uh, this would be a very, very, very broad talk if I went into all of the possible solutions. Maybe you need more instances. Maybe you can shard your databases. Maybe you could sprinkle some cues on top of everything. Um, today we're going to be talking about caching. So when I say caching, I mean storing and retrieving data from a high performance store. I'm explicitly not talking about this kind of cache. Uh, so we're not talking about hardware caches. You might know that your processor has things called like an L1 and an L2 cache. Uh, we're going to be talking about the principle of caching as it applies to distributed systems. So these are quote unquote all numbers that all programmers should know. I kept the quotes there intentionally. These are honestly mostly folklore. But they're sourced from several computer science papers and from several talks. You can find all of the links at the uh, GitHub link down below. Um, but even though they're folklore, there's a lot of use here. And the utility comes not from the particular numbers, but the orders of magnitude between each step in that list. And these give us a good sense of intuition to start thinking about reasonable designs. So this is why we use caching. Uh, reading from memory is always much, much, much faster than reading from hard disk. And you can see that in the way that the numbers get bigger and bigger. Now, if you've used caches before, you might be familiar with memcached, which is a uh, distributed and memory key value store. If you're being really pedantic, you'll pronounce it memcached. Um, you don't have to do that. Uh, Redis is an in-memory store that some people use as a cache, too. Uh, it stores data structures instead of simple keys and values. But the basic idea is the same. We mostly use memcached at Twitter, and we actually use a specific variant to us, which we've open sourced. It's called 2mcache if you're being pedantic, and 2mcache if you're not. I'm going to call it 2mcache or Twitter memcache. Uh, so this, the stuff I'm going to be talking about today is motivated by um, my team's work using Twitter memcache, but the principles should apply regardless of what kind of cache you're using. So these specifics don't really matter. All right, so we're going to get into some diagrams. So if you remember our very early Rails app that we built from our tutorial, um, this, the architecture diagram might look something like this. 
you have a service or application layer, it talks to a database. When you get a request in, the service queries the database, returns the data. Very straightforward, we've got one line. Now we want to add caching to see if this helps uh, our resiliency so that we can actually handle traffic spikes. So in this very basic setup, your application calls out to the cache to try and read something. If it's there, we return that data. If it's not there, call the database. Now, even for the most basic and naive approach, we have to make some explicit design decisions here. So we have to decide what we want to store in the cache. We have to decide uh, how long it should stay in there. Is there such a thing as stale data? Do we want to, um, you know, does this data ever change? Is there a sense of freshness? We also have to decide what to do when the cache becomes full. So you can only fit so much stuff into memory, and unless you have a very small data set that entirely fits into memory, you'll have to decide what happens when you want to add something to a full cache. What do you evict? And then what do you do when data changes? So if someone sends a write request to your database or to your application and they want to modify something, what do you do then? So before we get into some possible answers, I'm going to introduce a teensy bit of jargon. Uh, so a TTL, or time to live, is the amount of time that we're considering something in the cache to be valid. And then a hit and a miss, um, something is a cache hit if we look for it and we find it. It's a miss if we look for it and we don't find it. And then LRU is one common strategy for determining what to evict. So when you're trying to push something into a cache that's full, you say, get rid of the thing that I used uh, last. All right, so in our first setup, as we are struggling with our basic Rails app to survive traffic spikes, we might take this approach. It's a read through LRU cache. So it's what many people reach for first. So all queries will first check the cache. If you get a hit, return that to the user. If you get a miss, query the database. And you'll return that to the user, and you'll also stick it into your cache with some sort of TTL. On writes, you will invalidate keys in the cache, and you will treat expired keys as misses. So if you go to look something up in the cache and it's there, but the TTL has passed, you're going to say, oh, just kidding, it's not there. And when the cache is full, we're going to evict based on LRU. So these are some possible answers uh, to the questions that we have to answer uh, before we even start using caching. All right, so does this work? Uh, and the answer is mostly, you're in a better place than before, um, but we've introduced some new problems to our system and we can do a lot better. So some of these problems. Uh, with this setup, you're guaranteeing that cache misses occur because they occur every time something in the cache expires. And because everything expires based on the TTL, you're guaranteeing that your end users will be the ones to pay that latency penalty and you're guaranteeing that misses will occur on a regular basis. So your backing stores are going to see inconsistent traffic levels because the traffic is driven by a combination of things in cache expiring, as well as real users querying for them. Now, none of these problems are the end of the world. Um, it's better than the situation we had before. You can handle a little bit more traffic, uh, but we can do better. All right. So, Something that people often reach for next is introducing a concept of soft and hard TTLs, where your soft TTL is much shorter than your hard TTL. So the whole point of having a TTL is to keep your cache data fresh. But we can decouple the decision about is this fresh enough to actually serve it to an end user with the question of should I go update this data? So in having a soft and hard TTL lets us do that. So when we have two TTLs, a uh, soft and a hard, when we get a read request in and we find something in the cache, if the soft TTL has expired, we'll treat it as a cache hit and return it to the user. But in the background, we'll go and refresh that data so that we can guarantee that it'll be uh, fresh in the cache. Now, if the hard TTL has expired, we're still gonna treat it as cache miss. So beyond the hard TTL, we're saying that the data is useless to us. Um, so these are some examples of values that we might use for soft and hard TTLs. Some portions of my code base use a two-hour soft TTL and a 12-hour hard TTL. Um, but different, datas, uh, different pieces of data should get different TTLs based on your business needs. So the user service. Uh, Twitter users are complicated bundles of data, basically. Um, one item that we store is the profile link highlight color, which you can change. No one really minds if that's a little bit stale. I promise. Um, but that versus whether or not your account is private, that matters a lot more. So we can tolerate a lot less staleness for that value. So because of that, you should be tuning these based on your business needs. Now, 
Memcache supports a concept of a native TTL, but it's a pretty simplistic thing and you can't do stuff like soft or hard TTLs with it. So instead you have to implement it at your uh, application layer. So this is not supported by Memcache natively, but it's not too hard to implement and we'll get into what the interface looks like in code for it later on. All right. So I've talked a little bit about a hypothetical caching setup and how you might evolve a very naive caching strategy. Um, and now I'm gonna get into the good stuff of the actual challenges that we see on the user service at Twitter. All right, so like I mentioned, uh, users are bundles of data uh, and the user service handles all reads and writes to user data. So that's live in production. That's both when you hit twitter.com and you load a timeline and there might be, you know, a couple hundred users in that timeline with their profile images and their screen names and all of that. It's also for things like offline data analysis so that business analytics can calculate things like how many monthly active users do we have on the site. And user data includes a lot of different things. So there's your screen name and your display name. There's also your profile image URL. There's also your account settings, whether or not you're protected or verified. Um, a lot of stuff goes into making a user. So we handle millions of queries per second. And we do that with thousands of instances of our service. So we deal with a decent amount of traffic. Now, each service at Twitter has very different characteristics and patterns. That's the whole reason why the core services are divided up the way that they are. And the user service uh, has its own particularities. So for one, we have way more reads than writes. So again, if you think about the Twitter timeline, you see a whole lot of users rendered there. Um, people update their Twitter uh, user objects, so whether that's their account settings or something like that, that happens a lot less often. So it's very uneven reads versus writes. We also see traffic spikes driven by major events. That's just quintessentially Twitter. So whether or not that's a sporting event or something in politics or a natural disaster, um, traffic spikes happen all the time. We also see really uneven traffic across the ID space. So some people are much more popular than others. It's just true. Taylor Swift is always gonna have a lot more traffic to her user ID than I will. Um, and so, you know, uh, we can't expect even traffic based on IDs. And writes often happen in a flurry of consecutive writes. So if you update one field, you're probably gonna have more updates following that. It's also a pretty large data set because we're dealing with all users ever created at Twitter. Um, so we can't do something naive like just shove it all into memory. All right, so if you remember our simple application diagram, this is not what my world looks like. Instead, it looks something a little bit more like this. Uh, the user service has over a dozen backends that we depend upon. These are things like the email service or the social graph service or geo, not to mention our own databases. And none of those services are running on a single instance either. So if we were to actually whiteboard out all of the real connections, we would be here all day. And this was our basic setup for caching. In reality, it looks a little bit more like this. So uh, the user service has its own cache cluster, which again contains many, many instances. Now in code, we want to group these logically connected things together. So we'll talk about having an email cache or a social graph cache, even though it's all the same cache cluster. Um, so in code, we represent them a little bit like this, but everything in the TAN is all located uh, physically in the same place. All right. So earlier we talked about why we, why we might want to use caching. So let's look at whether or not that works for the user service. One, we want to respond faster than the backing stories. Yes, God yes. Um, we can do things a lot, lot faster when we serve it out of cache. Secondly, we also wanted to reduce pressure on our backing stores. So we wanted to send them less traffic and more regular traffic so that it's easier for, and cheaper for them to run. Now when we introduced caching with soft and hard TTLs, we saw a pretty big shift in query pattern. So you can see on the one side, we've got these huge waves of periodic uh, traffic waves. Those are happening over the course of hours. Um, and then once we introduced soft and hard TTLs, you can see that the line flattens out. So that's much better. Our database team likes that better. And we rely very, very heavily on cache. So 99.9% .9 of all requests are served out of cache. On a good day, that's much higher. 
Um, and this doesn't mean that we have like almost the entire user space in cache. It means that for incoming requests, over 99.9% .9 of them are served from cache. And that's an important distinction. It's what lets us be as efficient as we are. All right. So now I've given you sort of an overview of the state of the world. Let's talk about some problems because those are more fun. All right. So the first one I mentioned a little bit earlier is traffic spikes. And these are absolutely essential to how our business works. Um, so whether or not something like the World Cup or Japanese New Year's, um, fun fact, Japanese New Year's is our biggest New Year's Eve hour. Um, spikes are a totally normal part of our business. And one of our most famous ones and, or infamous ones internally is this. Uh, so this is the selfie that broke Twitter. How many of you have seen this selfie? Yeah, nice. All right, so for a long time, this photo had the record for the most retweets that has since been broken. Um, Ellen DeGeneres broke Twitter on live TV, which was really exciting. Um, we actually have a painting of this photograph on the wall at Twitter HQ, which <laughs> has been memorialized. Um, so you'll notice that there's a lot of celebrities in this photo. And what happened when this got tweeted and when Ellen said on live television, hey guys, you should all retweet this, um, a handful of user lookups became very popular very quickly. Now, all of our on-call engineers were watching the Oscars live in a room together, as it happened. Um, and all of them turned to look at each other and went, oh, well, this will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens when this handful of user lookups all become massively popular is that that traffic all falls onto a pretty small number of cache nodes. And we overwhelmed our memcache cluster. So that was embarrassing. Let's fix it. So for a solution, we can turn for inspiration back to these numbers that every programmer should know. So even though we were reading from our memcache cluster, it was still way too slow. Now, we could have added an enormous amount more capacity, I suppose, to account for that, but that wouldn't really help. Uh, instead, what about reading from main memory instead of doing a same DC round trip? So that'll be a 1,000 times faster. And we can use this to solve the Ellen selfie problem. So now what we have is we have an in-process hotkey cache. Um, why in-process? Because it's much faster. Why hotkeys? Because we can't fit everything. So we define hotkeys as um, keys which we look up more than a certain number of times per minute. We just call them hot. Uh, this is tuned empirically. Uh, it's basically the result of several production incidents and the cumulative knowledge we have gained from that. Um, and we put a 30-second TTL on that cache. So it's very, very short. Um, so that we don't have to worry about this being too stale. But this allows us to defend ourselves against things like the Ellen selfie problem. So other events which no longer uh, cause us these kinds of problems, which used to, the World Cup, the Oscars, the Olympics, presidential inaugurations, um, lots of things cause this pattern of uh, spiky lookups for either one or a handful of users. And it's very nice not to worry about them anymore. So. That's hotkey caching. It's great. We should have added it earlier. All right. Problem number two is outages. So in a complex distributed system, failure and degradation are totally normal events. Uh, but this can manifest in some unintuitive ways. So raise your hand if you've heard of a retry storm before. Ooh, OK. A few hands. Um, yeah, this is a really common scenario. So I'm going to talk through it really quick. We've got a super simple service diagram here. A calls B, which calls C. Nice and straightforward. When everything is working, data flows in one direction, data comes back out. This should be great. Now, let's say that service C isn't doing so well. It's a little bit unhealthy. And B calls C. Well, A calls B, which then calls C. Now, this request fails. But that's fine, because service B is configured to retry everything twice. Um, so it issues two more requests, and they both fail. So after querying C three times, service B gives up and tells A, I'm sorry, this request has failed. A says, no problem, I'll retry twice. Uh, so you can see where this is going, because each of those requests is going to balloon. So in this very simple world, one incoming request balloons out to nine if service C is down. and you can imagine a world where, say, 10 services are calling B, and 10 services are calling each of those, and these things can quickly get out of hand at the worst possible moment. Now, while all of this is going on, the team who's running service C is desperately trying to keep things afloat, 
And maybe they could have if you all hadn't been giant jerks and dumped a bunch of traffic on them when they did not want it. Um, and for a service like mine, uh, so the user service has over 300 customer services within the company. So that's a lot. If all of those hit us with a retry storm when things get bad, that is not fun. Um, but luckily, caching can help us with this. So we have a solution that we call dark moding or auto dark mode auto dark moding or back pressure or automated back off. We really need to standardize our naming. Um, whatever you call it, uh, the idea is pretty simple, but it's very effective. So when you notice that your success rate is starting to drop, stop sending it a bunch of traffic. That's no good. Why would you do that? Um, slow the torrent of traffic down to a trickle, just enough so that you can keep measuring success rate. So. Now, we don't want to reject all of those requests because that just, you know, creates the problem all over again. Um, but instead, if you have a decent cache hit rate, you can just serve stale data out of your cache. And then you can gradually restore traffic as your backends recover. Now, this isn't ideal. You're still serving stale data. Depending on your business needs, this may or may not be acceptable. But it's a lot better uh, than causing an incident while an incident is going on. All right. So the TLDR, dark moding is great. We like it. We use it extensively. Um, if your cache hit rate is reasonable, this is a really uh, great thing to implement and a really easy win. All right. So the next problem uh, is the case of the missing account. So this happened in the middle of a Lakers game. Uh, the Lakers account disappeared. That was, uh, that was fun. We got a lot of really sad user reports and a lot of very, very confused things. Again, of course, uh, games are on live TV, so it was fun to watch on live television as everyone went, where did the Lakers go? So before I dig into this, a quick shout out uh, to Etsy's Coda's Craft blog and specifically the Blameless Postmortems post. If you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend it. So all incidents at Twitter get postmortems where the goal is to figure out what happened, and then why did that happen, and then why did that happen, what made it possible for this to happen. Uh, we try to figure out what we can do to stop the same kind of thing from happening again. So you can imagine, this warranted a postmortem. Uh, so our team started digging into how on earth the Lakers account had vanished. Um, so was this an application layer bug? Did we have like a bad deploy? Was there an obscure, untested code path? How on earth did we do this? Um, the TLDR is that what probably happened is that we cached uh, a transient not found result from our database. Everything else was behaving as expected. Uh, but when you're dealing with as much data as we do, we expect that sometimes weird stuff will just happen. Um, sometimes things get corrupted in transit. Maybe there are ghosts. I don't know. Um, the problem here was not that we had gotten a bad value back. We should be able to handle that. The issue is that once we got the bad value, we kept it in cash, which is how we serve traffic during spikes during things such as sports games. Um, and our default cache time was 12 hours. So a single bad value from the database would stick around for 12 hours. And for something like a not found, that's really not good. So what do you do when you don't trust your database? It's sort of a large existential question. Um, <laughs> But this issue is not limited to not bounds. Uh, any piece of data can be incorrect or incomplete or corrupted. Uh, we really want to be able to handle that regardless. So this is a favorite paper of mine. It's called How Complex Systems Fail by Richard Cook. Um, and it has a really nice line. Uh, so complex systems contain changing mixtures of failure latent within them. So again, any kind of data can be incorrect or incomplete or corrupted, and we have to expect that that will always be true and that we will not be able to predict how that will manifest. It's just going to happen. We might as well be ready for it. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour, which might help explain why this is so easy uh, or why we should expect these kinds of failures to be common. So let's talk about cross data center replication. Now, we have an eventually consistent database. Uh, and as someone uh, joked to me earlier at this conference, eventually consistent means inconsistent. Um, so any incoming write request that our service gets uh, needs to update its own cache. 
Then it needs to write to the database, and this is all in one data center. And then we need to update the other data center's cache. And then we have to rely on our database to handle its own cross data center replication across all of our data centers. Yeah, this should scare you. Um, so this is a recipe for race conditions. It's really great. Race conditions make us sad. Um, and for some kinds of values, this is okay, um, but this is inevitably going to result in the kind of black eye like a account just disappearing. Now, if we think again about the basics of querying from cache versus querying from the underlying database, we have this TTL, which basically tunes uh, how fresh we want data to be. So we could decrease all of our soft TTLs to mitigate the impact of this kind of caching of bad data. That will result in more traffic to our backing stores. That'll put more pressure on them. That's more expensive. So now we're in this awkward situation where we're trying to decide on a trade-off between resiliency with operational load. There are many reasonable ways that you could make that trade-off. There are plenty of answers that I could defend on the grounds of business needs. Um, but I don't like having to make that trade-off. That just seems like we're losing either way. So we did something different. And what we ended up doing was scaled TTLs. Now, this only works if your eventually consistent database is, in fact, eventually consistent. Um, but luckily, that's not my problem to solve. So the idea is that we're going to adjust our TTL based on the likelihood that a value is correct. We're going to start it at a very short amount of time and ramp up. And to the user, this will make it seem like any inconsistencies fix themselves while it doesn't add any operational load to our own databases. So this is great. So how do we build confidence? How do we get an idea that probably this value is correct? The answer there is repetition. So when something's soft detail expires, we have to go and fetch it from the database anyway. So what we do is we say that, hey, if the value is staying the same on consecutive reads, it's probably pretty good. Um, it's a good signal for accuracy without having to make any sort of extra expensive calls. So when, we, when a value changes, whether or not that's like on its initial creation or on write, and we put it into cache, we start the TTL at two minutes. And we also store a counter for how many times we have consecutively read the same value. The next time when it expires, we say, hey, is the value the same? If it's different, then we'll keep the TTL at two minutes until things fix themselves. And if it's the same, we'll bump it up to 30 minutes, and then six hours, and then 12 hours, and then 24 hours. Now, um, these particular steps uh, were things that we chose uh, because they worked in practice, um, but also because they have the nice property of resulting in the same number of reads to the database over a several day span as our old TTL values did. So again, this did not cost us anything extra, but it made it so that inconsistent results would get fixed more quickly. So if we think about the Lakers case, before with our you know, very simple unscaled TTLs, if we received a transient bad value, the user service would go great. That's awesome, I'll put it in my cache. And then 12 hours later, we would notice that it was wrong. So that's really bad. We don't like things sticking around for that long. And now we have scaled TTLs. So when we receive a not found, it's different from the previous value. And the user service notices that. So uh, we reset the soft TTL step to zero. And then two minutes later, a read through will occur. And we'll notice that now the Lakers account exists. So then two minutes after that, we'll check again. And two minutes after that, we'll check again. And once we settle on a consistent value, then that's what stays in cache for longer. So we like measuring things. Uh, we keep track of stats on both inconsistencies. So we uh, dispatch RPC calls to measure what another data center thinks. And we also keep track of which step, how many consecutive reads, things tend to cluster at. So we only go up to step four, because anything higher than that, we just pretend doesn't exist. Um, on the left, you can see the step distribution for an immutable field. So racy write conditions don't happen. Um, so that's sort of the perfect state, the balanced steady state given create traffic. Uh, 
And on the right, we have a field that sees the most frequent clustered flurry of writes. So it's the field that is most vulnerable to race conditions. And as you can see, instead of clustering towards that purple green stuff at the top, um, there's a lot of green. There's also a really nice bar of spiky things at the bottom where you can see that it's usually inconsistent for the first few minutes. So the implementation of this. It's very, very similar to implementing soft TTLs. We store a short which contains the number of consecutive consistent reads. And when it's inconsistent, we reset it to zero. So pretty simple logic, doesn't take up too much extra space. And after we implemented it, uh, and we deployed it, and we scaled it up, and we measured some stuff, uh, we saw that we had up to a 30% reduction in cross DC inconsistencies. So that was awesome. Uh, and the change was most dramatic on user data where changes happen frequently, which makes sense. So, and we're defining inconsistency as data changing between reads when we don't expect it to. So that was exciting. And this has several benefits. So we get to magically mask eventually inconsistent or flaky database behavior. We also um, found it to be pretty simple to adopt and implement. Uh, it didn't require a ton of complex integration on our, on our end. It also adapts organically to different query patterns. So for different fields of the user, things behave very differently, but this has the nice characteristic of it just adapts on its own. You don't have to do a lot of manual tuning. There are a few gotchas. So the first is that it requires a gradual ramp up. You have to have this data before you use it to make decisions. Otherwise, if you just deploy it uh, straightforwardly, you'll find that everything has an initial number of consecutive reads of zero, which means suddenly your TTLs for everything will plummet down to two minutes. Don't do that. Um, you also need to use this in tandem with dark moding or automated back off or automated back pressure, whatever you call that kind of mechanism. If you don't, you have successfully caused your own retry storm. Um, because in the face of flaky behavior from your database, this will send more traffic because your TTLs will be shorter. So you have to take the operational impact into consideration a little bit when you're deploying this. Um, talk to your database team before you do this, please. Um, so if you want to figure out whether or not this is something which can be useful for your service. So first of all, measure. Do you have these problems? Is this actually something that you're seeing in production? Then think about what your write traffic looks like, how much staleness is acceptable to you, whether or not these trade-offs are actually reasonable for your service. All right, but if these trade-offs are reasonable, congrats, you should do it. All right, uh, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is some of the programming idioms we use to make it easier for service owners at Twitter to implement these things correctly. So we have an internal library that's designed to encourage um, decomposition and reuse of common pieces of service architecture. Uh, it's called Servo. These examples are all going to be in Scala, but the language really doesn't matter too much. Um, there's just gonna be some type annotations. All right. So the first thing that we have is a repository type. Uh, you ask it something and eventually it answers. That's all that that type says. So the future contains the eventual result, you ask it something of type Q, that's fine. Then we have a notion of something called a key value repository where you can ask it for information about several keys at once. It returns a result which contains a mixture of like founds and not founds. So pretty basic. So we have a key value repository of type Q, K, and V. Q is usually a sequence of values, or sequence of keys, sorry. All right. We also have a cache trait, which gives us a unified way to talk about caches. None of this stuff is particularly memcache specific. It just means that we can do set and get and add and delete. They're not particularly complex, complex interfaces. All right. So the first thing we're gonna do is abstract away the caching behavior. So you give uh, this caching key value repository constructor a cache and a underlying repository, it gives you back a cache and key value repository. Like the name implies, when you call the cache and key value repository, it handles all of the caching nonsense for you. 
Same thing for dark moding. Same exact interface, except now it has extra logic around measuring the success rate uh, from the repository so that it can make decisions about whether or not to serve stale data out of cache. All right. Now you might have noticed in those type signatures that there's a uh, type called a cached of V. And this is just the metadata that I had mentioned earlier. So because memcache does not natively support things like a soft TTL or keeping track of the number of consecutive uh, consistent reads, things like that, instead of just storing a value of type V, we store a cached of V, which contains a tiny bit of extra information that we use to make smarter decisions. Now when we wire it all together, the names start to get really long. We have a scale dark mode and caching key value repository. Um, yeah, the names tend to get a little bit too long. And what this does is it basically hides like this Russian nesting doll lo logic, which can get uh, really easy to wire up incorrectly. So when, you, when should you do auto dock moding? When should you read through to the underlying data store? Um, how do you calculate the soft and hard TTLs? All of this is handled by uh, this scaled dark moding caching key value repository. <laughs> which is a terrible tongue twister. Um, but you shove all of that logic into one place and you never think about it again. But if you have to go figure out uh, how it works, that's where you look. Now, actually querying your repository becomes much easier. You just ask your caching repo for a user ID and that's the end of that. So now all of the caching and hydration logic is hidden from you. All right, so what are the end results here? So we use caching to solve a lot of our problems on the user service. It helps us weather traffic spikes, inconsistent databases, total outages, uh, and it lets us do all of that while serving millions of queries per second. And hopefully you never see twitter.com go down. Um, and we use a combination of scaled, soft, and hard TTLs in conjunction with auto dark moding, and that keeps us up and running even under really extreme conditions. We've had cases where our database went down for hours at a time and nobody noticed, which was really exciting. All right, uh, so another quote from How Complex Systems Fail. Uh, Failure-free operations require continuous experience with failure, which is, you know, one of those things that looks like a paradox until you think about it. So all of the incidents and failure modes that I've described in this talk, uh, they're the reason why Twitter.com is more robust today. So good postmortem analyses can help you learn critically important lessons from production incidents and hopefully stop them from happening again. Um, so yeah, if there's one thing I want you to take away, it's that caching is kind of great. Um, but first, you need to figure out what you're using it for. So the strategies that we use on the user service are designed for our particular problem space. They're very particular to us. Um, and the robustness of it is a direct consequence of the knowledge that we've earned from real failures. So if it wasn't tailored for us, it would be a lot less useful. Um, so go forth. Hopefully some of this is useful for your own service designs. Uh, but first, measure. All right. So thank you very much. Uh, if you want the slides, they're there. I'm on the next.